something serious. First Timothy chapter 1, if you will, this morning. It is good to have everybody here. It is good to see you on the first, first Sunday of the new year. And as we begin a new year and as we begin to look at into the coming year and we have great anticipation for things happening in your life and in all of our lives and our family life and so forth, it, I, I think it's good sometimes just to pause and to begin to kind of think about some things and think about you personally. I do this every December. I sit back and take a stock of, of the year. Of, uh, I have goals. I don't write goals down because I don't like to be frustrated at the end of the year. So I don't write them down, but I do have them, and I have them in my head and everything, and I look back and say, okay, we didn't get that done. We got to get that done. We got to work, you know, and so forth. And that's a self-barometer check for me. I've always done this. And as we come back into the new year and as goals get set, and I have some for the ministry-wise and everything, which over, the, over this month we'll be share, I'll share some of them with you, especially at the, end of the, at the State of the Assembly address at the end of the month. And again, as we begin to think about that, thinking about goals, and thinking about everything, I, <laughs> the end of the year, you get a, I get a lot of emails from all of the statistic people, and how many believers still read the Bible, and how many this, and, and you know, we could do that for an hour, but it wouldn't be of any real benefit for you, I don't believe. And when you think about goal setting, goal setting is a good thing, it really is. It's a way of measuring, and it's a way of, of measuring where you're going and what you're doing, and I would encourage you to write them down. I, don't, I do, but I don't, you know, type of thing. But as you do that, we begin to think about our, what we're anticipating and, and, what, and so forth. And I just got to thinking about where our focus should be. Saturday, we're going to start back up at the swap meet. That's a great thing. That's a great place to have your focus. And Paul in 1 Timothy 1, verse 16 here, I just want to think about this. He says, Howbeit for this cause I obtain mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him the life everlasting. Our pattern in everything is the Apostle Paul. It's everything that was given to him doctrinally, it's everything that, that then he then writes to you and I. He becomes our pattern, 2 Timothy chapter 2, if you will, 2 Timothy 2. And when you begin to think about Paul, and you begin to think about him as our pattern, Scripture doesn't hide the sins of its heroes. It never does. And it's very interesting in, the, in Paul's epistles, he lays out things for us to look at and to consider and to, and to think about. 2 Timothy 2, 7, consider what I say. And the Lord give the understanding in some things. Not all things, see. So when you begin to think about all the things, all the details of life, you know, Paul's the one that says, hey, get a haircut and get a real job. Get a job. Paul's the one that tells us, here's what the family structure looks like. Here's what the marriage. Paul lays this pattern out for us. And as we begin to think about goal setting and priorities and, and things that we're looking for in the new year. That's why I titled this, What to Do in 2022. I actually get a rhyme for a change, you know. And when you think about that and when you think about what Paul's doing, Paul's our pattern. Come over to Philippians chapter 3. I just, I, I just, want, to, I just want you to get a flavor from Paul about thinking about the new year. 2020 was a rough year. 21 was a little less rougher. It was still rough. 22 then is going to be what? <laughs> the same. But you know why it's the same? Because we're, where are we at? We're in a sin-cursed creation. It's just going to be men, society, wax what? Worse and worse. See? So it's not something that we should be surprised about. But then yet, what do we do? What do we think about? How do we then move? Look at Philippians 3 in verse 4. Though I, now the I here is Paul, though I might also have confidence in the flesh. If any, and by the way, he's just said, have no confidence in the flesh, the end of verse 3. 
But he says, so if you think you can have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Look at Paul, circumcised of the eighth day, of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is the in the law, blameless. Look at who he was in his past life. What was he? Concerning zeal. That thing about zeal, zealous. He had a plan. He had goals. He, he was going somewhere. He's persecuting the church. Come back to Acts 7. A, a great thing I think we miss when we think about Saul of Tarsus or the Apostle Paul, look at, look at Acts 7. He was moving. He was, Paul wasn't just as Saul of Tarsus in his old life. He wasn't just hanging around waiting for things to happen. He was pushing the envelope. He was moving because he, he had a goal. He had something in front of him he wanted to attain. Look at Acts 7. Look at verse 58. and ca Talking about the stoning of Stephen here, but I want you to catch something. And cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. So he's there. Now look at 8.1. And Saul was what? Consenting unto his death. Notice that Saul, that when they stoned Stephen, they looked to Saul to get the thumbs up. He was consenting. Doesn't see he was there witnessing. He was there giving the voice of authority. Of, hey, it's good. Do it. Thumbs up. Get it done. Let's go. So Paul was not just some guy laid on you know, the back end just you know, throwing brick. He wasn't the brick supplier. He was the guy giving the order to throw the bricks. Chapter 9. Chapter 9, verse 1, And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went in unto the high priest. He goes in. He doesn't have to have an appointment. He just showed up and went in. The secretary says, Hey, how you doing, Saul? Yeah, go ahead. He's waiting for you. And desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto, unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And then you have his conversion and commissioning on the road to Damascus. I want you to see what was Saul. Who was Saul? He was an important man in the Jews' religion. Galatians 1, look over there, Galatians 1. I think about this when you think about, you know, making priorities or making goals or thinking about things. Look at Galatians 1, look at verse 13. Paul's own, uh, own witness, for ye have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it and profited in the Jews' religion above many mine equals in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. Paul, his persecution and his goal and his thinking was more to than just, just to get rich, more than just to climb the ladder, but it was to be it was to have the security of society, to have the security of the finance, to, to, to climb. and Come over to John 16. Great verse. I hope I wrote this down on your handout. John 16. Just a wonderful way that the Lord describes this. And he, his whole goal was that when he walked in, people would what? Listen. You know? E.F. Hutton, when he speaks, everyone listens. When Saul of Tarsus spoke, everyone did what? They listened. He was con they consented. He consent. He gave his thumbs up. He's got access immediately into the high priest. He gets authority to go. Nobody stopped him on the road and said, hey, by whose authority are you coming? They knew that. They had that. John 16, verse 1, These things have I spoken unto you that ye should not be offended. They shall put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time cometh that whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. 
And these things will they do unto you because they have not known the Father nor me. There's a great description of what Saul of Tarsus was doing. He think, He's zealous of the Father's tradi- the, their traditions of the Father. He thinks he's doing what God would have him do. Let's get rid of the scourge. And he's right there. So there's more to this than just climbing ladders and getting up the ladder. It's, it's his passion. It's his zeal. It's his push. But what happened in Acts 9? <laughs> well, that great line, light shined around about him, and all of a sudden it's, Who are you, Lord? And, hey, I'm Jesus of Nazareth, whom you persecute. And it's, Oh, my goodness, oh, no, now what? Come over to Romans 15. And you know what happened on the road to Damascus, Paul's, Saul of Tarsus, Career, viewpoint, thinking changed. And the most startled creature on the road wasn't Saul of Tarsus. It was the adversary because the Lord introduces to him right there on the road to Damascus Paul's gospel and then the dispensation of grace and what he's going to do. Paul then, his whole priority changed. What was his priority before? Status, prestige, fame, import. Now look at what he says, Romans 15, 15. Nevertheless, brethren, I have written the more boldly unto you in some sort as putting you in mind because of the grace that is given to me of God that I should be the what? The minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles. What is he now? He's no longer the great persecutor. What is he? The minister. Romans 11, verse 13. I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I am the apostle. Look over there. I, I, I just think about this. 11, 13. What does he say? I am the apostle of the Gentiles. I magnify my office. Chapter 1 of Romans, he says, I'm ready to preach. You ought to go through sometimes and see how many times Paul says, I'm ready to do something. 1 Timothy 1, he says, I am faithful. 116, we read it a minute ago, I am the pattern. 2 Timothy 4, he says, I'm ready to depart. I'm ready. He's got a whole thinking that's been adjusted. Philippians 3, he comes in there and goes, you know what? I want to know the Lord more and more and more. Philippians 4, he says, I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I have been instructed. Why? The whole book of Philippians, Paul saying the Christ is the center of everything. Come over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians 5. There's been a change in his thinking. Just for you and I. I mean, we sit, look, we got jobs, you got life, you got family, you've got things going on. Hey, what, 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 what's driving me? What's driving you? Again, Paul had fame and fortune, he had prestige. And yet in Philippians 3, we didn't read it there a minute ago, he says, what, I count it all, but what? Lost. I count it all lost. I gladly give it up that I may know the righteousness of God, and I may know him and the power of his resurrection and be conformed to the image of his death. I, I'm, I give it all up for him. Somebody one time said, I, I read this in a, in a little pamphlet, that Paul was so wealthy <laughs> yeah, so wealthy. How wealthy? Well, there's always one in the crowd, right? He was that when when Christ met him on the road to Damascus, and he began to then go and do the ministry. He his apostolic journeys. He was never a missionary. Don't call those missionary journeys. He's an apostle that the funds that he had in the bank account is what funded all of that. And he was, spend me, gladly be spent, use me up. You know that passage there in Corinthians? And then when you see him start talking about taking the poor, the saints, the collection for the poor saints at Jerusalem, and he begins to talk about giving, and he begins to talk about supporting the local church and supporting and doing, 
that those are, and when he says, I've learned in what service state to be content, when he says, I've, I know what it is to abound, I know what it is to have a base. Well, if you quit working for the religious push, what happens to your income? It doesn't take long to burn through that. And you know what he was? He was willing to do it. Sometimes some of us are so stra- so connected into what the market's doing that if it takes a hiccup, we're hiccuping. And uh, again, what was the, what's the pressure point? What's the thinking? What's the process? What's the push? 2 Corinthians 5, look at verse 14. For some of us, and I'm not, I say us because that includes me, our push is po- politics and the political arena. Our push is in the financial arena. Our push is over here in the sports, in the entertainment. And you know what begins to happen? Those things begin to do what? Consume us. And it shouldn't. Who can change it is you. (laughs) I can't change you. I change me. And I'm working on me. You need to work on you. What did Paul have? Paul was a politician, folks. Saul of Tarsus. He was a politician. What's the, what's the he sat at the feet of Gamaliel. Do you remember Gamaliel? Do you remember who he what he said? He sits there and he says, "Hey, the guy got healed." He says, "I don't care what you say. We're not speaking against God and what he just did right there." Now I'm for killing him, but we're not going to say God didn't do that right there. Saul of Tarsus sees that. He know how to wield the, po- the politics, the financial arena. He's in it. He's there. And yet, look at 2 Corinthians 5.14. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that, we, that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth, what? Live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. What a mind shift. What a thinking shift. Now, he didn't say, go quit your job. He didn't say, don't support and do. He says, what? Let's do that with the right thinking. Let's do that with the right mindset. If you know, you're know you married and you got children, you got, a, you got a food bill to fill. If you're single, you've got a food bill to fill. How do you do that? You work. Or mom and dad support you, which that never happened in my case. But you got things to do. You've got, com- you got, but what's the push? Why am I doing that? Our thinking needs to, his thinking changed. Our thinking needs to be adjusted. If you keep reading, wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. What's the old things? The old way of thinking. Again, the moment you got saved, you didn't go out and quit your job. I hope you didn't. What do you do? You you went to work. You went to work with a little bit of step in it, and you were excited to tell everybody, and that's wonderful, but Paul doesn't just get out of life. He doesn't quit life. Come back, come back to Acts 18. He doesn't just leave life. He says, hey, I, we're in life. We live life, Acts 18. You got work to do, but when you do it, let's do it with the right motivation. Let's do it with the love of Christ constraining us. Let's do it with the right thinking. I, I You know, <laughs> am I preaching to the choir this morning? I hope so. Acts 18, notice something here with Paul. Verse 1, after these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome and came unto them, and because he was of the same craft. He abode with them and wrought, for by their occupation they were tent makers. Now think about this. Here's Saul of Tarsus. He's this great influencer, heavily in the religious system, yet he had a job. What was his job? Tent maker. 
He had learned the craft. He had learned the trade. Now, he's over here doing, he's prospering, so maybe now he ain't working nine to five, seven days a week at the, well, six days a week in their case. But now what is he having to do? The bank account's empty. We got to eat is right. And we're going to do this. Look over at chapter 20. He, he had a job. He wrought with his hands. He worked. Look at chapter 20, Acts 20. Look over at verse 34. Yea, you, you, yourself, ye, ye yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessities and to them that were with me. I have showed you all things, how that so laboring ye ought to support the weak and to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Do you know that that, that saying right there only occurs right there? It's never recorded in the Gospels where the Lord said that. Now, I know what they do. They put a little note on there and say Luke 14, but you go read Luke 14 and you don't find that. It is more blessed to what? To give than to receive. Obviously, the Lord said it somewhere. It just wasn't recorded except for here. And Luke records it. But what I want you to see is what did Paul do? Notice his priority. What did he do? He worked. He provided for his own necessities, and to them that were with me. What did he do? He got up, 6 o'clock in the morning, goes over, works till lunchtime, leaves lunch, goes to school of one of Tyrannius, has a Bible study during lunch, gets done with lunch, goes back to work, finishes the day on his way home, stops back by the the, the grocery store, picks up the groceries for, for the guys because he's got a whole group with him, and then they eat dinner, and then he goes out house to house having Bible study. The man worked for a living. And he did that until he got thrown in jail. By the way, what happened when he got thrown in jail? The work still went on. He just stuck. You know, he finally got three meals a day, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> or one meal but what ha Paul's whole thing, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, early book of Paul, probably one of the first, one, the first, if not one, Galatians before, but 1 Thessalonians 2. Look at verse 9. For ye remember, brethren, our labor and travail, for laboring night and day, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you, we preached unto you the gospel of God. Notice why he worked. So there wouldn't be a what? A charge, a burden. Do you know that he he tells he tells the Corinthians, I could have come in and demanded you take care of me because I'm the apostle. But I didn't do that. I came and I labored. I worked. Chapter 3 of 2 Thessalonians, verse 8, he says, Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught but wrought with labor and travail night and day that we may not be that we might not be chargeable to any of you. Paul came along and he worked so that he could do what? Preach and teach. He worked. That's what he did in order to do the other. And guess what? Growing up I always heard the little saying from Bob Jones Sr.'s duties never conflict. And when the ministry and work conflict, did you know which one went to work, which one got taken care of? Ministry. That's eternal. Work is just for the moment. You can go without eating a day. You work. Paul worked so that he could teach and preach and do the work of the ministry. Again, you go back to Acts 19. He's over in the school. Acts 20. He's publicly house to house. He's out doing. You with me? His attitude changed. Before, what was he doing? He was zealous, zealous, going, going. Now his zeal is something else. His prior, his thinking changed. Come over to 1 Corinthians. Actually, you're in Thessalonians. On your way, stop in Philippians. Just, just notice this, by the way. Because not every time Paul could work. Paul couldn't work all the time. 
he, you know, if he goes into a, a new neighborhood and there's already a tent maker, it'd be kind of hard to set up a new shop. So you have the, the body step in. Philippians chapter 4, verse number 14, Paul says, Notwithstanding ye have well done, that ye did communicate with my affliction. Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concern in giving and receiving, but ye only. So don't ever say Paul doesn't talk about paying the preacher and taking care of the double honor. He's worthy of double honor, the one laboring in the word. What did these guys do? Now watch the next verse. For even in Thessalonica, wait a minute, didn't we just read in Thessalonica that he was working so he wouldn't be chargeable? And what's the little church in Macedonia and Philippi doing? They're sending him gifts. Not just once, verse 16, and again under my necessity. Not because I desired a gift. In other words, I didn't demand it. But rather, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. But I have all and abound. I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an odor of sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God. And again, what, would, what did Paul do? What was his mindset? What was his priority? We work so we can preach and teach. We work so we can do. 1 Corinthians 16. For years, that's always been my attitude. <laughs> we work. I drove the school bus. You go work in the grocery store. You do so that you can do the ministry. And when one conflicted with the other, guess what, what happened? <coughs> I'm sick today. <coughs> you go do the ministry. And fortunately, over the last year, I've been able to not have to work, and I appreciate that immensely because that takes a load off of having to do, you know. Uh, I had, we had a guy here one time, he's like, you work too much. I go, I know I do. He goes, you need to be ministering. I said, then you need to pay my work, my bills. He goes, well, that's not going to happen. I said, I know it is, and you need to be quiet and go on then. And he's like, well, that's not, you know, that's kind of attitude is that. I said, it's an honest attitude is what it is. I had another gentleman, he's like, hey, Rick, you should be full-time. I said, I know, it should show up in the offering box. By the way, there is an offering box in the back. Online, you can get, you know, I don't teach, I don't talk about the offering box because, folks, listen, giving comes from the heart. Giving is a cheerful giver issue, cheerful heart. If I have to sit here and rail and, and get on you about it, then the ministry doesn't mean anything to you, and we might as well sell the buildings and let's go fishing or something. I don't know, whatever you do. Okay, but that's not the case. The case is, is my point this morning is look at the priority. Look at the thinking. 1 Corinthians 16. I love verse 15. I beseech you, brethren, you know the house of Stephanus, that it is the first fruits of Achaia, and that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. Isn't that wonderful? Boy. An addiction. You know what an addiction is? You got to have it. Got to have more. Got to have more. Got to have more. You go over here to the 12 step programs, and guess what happens? You learn that you have to do what? You got to have more. And then you become addicted to the 12 step. It, why? Because addiction, what, where are your affections? Where's your thinking? Paul tells us, Colossians 3, we're to set our affections on things. Above, We are to be addicted to the ministry of the saints. That's why he'll tell the Romans, I long to see you. He'll go to the Corinthians and say, I long to see you. To the Philippians, I'm longing after being with you. To back there, he goes, I'm coming to you shortly. I have a great desire to see you. I want you to know of my estate and what's going on and what's happening. So Timothy's going to tell you, I want to know what's going on. And he, in uh, 2 Corinthians 11, he lists a whole bunch of group of people he's never seen by face, and yet he knows about them and the affairs of the church and everything. Why? Because that's what's important. That's what lasts for eternity. Come over to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. You see, Paul's 
goal. By the way, the giving thing, I was thinking about that. <laughs> Paul said to the Corinthians when he's talking to them about giving, he says, we only go until the money runs out. When the money runs out, we're done. And you Corinthians need to step up because you're wealthy. The little churches in, Achaia, in Macedonia and Achaia who are in deep poverty, they've stepped up. You haven't. And the reason they didn't was because their thinking was all off balance. And Paul's correcting that. 2 Corinthians 4, here's why. Therefore, seeing we have this, what? Ministry. As we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by the manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. That's our ministry verses right here. That's our, we're not, we got a ministry. Look at verse 7. But we have this treasure What's the treasure? The ministry. Where is it? It's in earthen vessels. Why? That. The excellency of the power may be of God and not of, our, uh, not of us. Hey, folks, this has nothing to do about you and I. It has to do about what? What he's doing in his program and his plan and, and our participating in it. Ephesians 4, he talks about the perfecting of the saints who will do the work of the ministry. There's a work of ministry to do, and it takes saints to do it. It takes perfected saints. Saints growing to come in and say, Lad, let's go, let's do it. Let's go back to the swap meet. Let's get back over here. We're not doing enough this way. We're not, And do what? Collectively come together and work. But what I want you to catch in verse 1 is what? We faint not. Because ministry is hard. Ministry is work. That's why it's called work of the ministry. Ministry is difficult at times. And you know what happens? Sometimes you just want to quit. You get discouraged. You get frustrated. You know, if that person calls me one more time, I'm going to throw them through the, you know, so block their number, right? No. No. If I don't answer your call, now you know why. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm, I, I am kidding. Yeah, welcome to the game. Watching, well, yeah, watching the game. No, what happens? Ministry, look, look over at chapter 11 of 2 Corinthians. I said it a minute ago here. Look at chapter 11. Look there at verse 23. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. In labors more abundantly, and stripes above measure, and prisons more frequently, and deaths off. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned, thrice I suffered a shipwreck. By the way, there is a fourth, and an if not a fifth, shipwreck not listed there. A night and a day I have been in the deep, in journeyings oft, in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, beside those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches." Who is weak and I am not weak? Who is offended and I burn not? If I must needs glory, I will glory of the things which concern mine infirmities. The, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is blessed forevermore, knoweth that I lie not. No matter what comes his way, what did Paul never do? He never quit. That's a priority. That's a zeal. That's a push. Yeah, but Rick, you know, you never know what's going to... No, look at what Paul went through. You and I never face that. In your worst day, you never go through. Could you imagine beaten, being beaten by a rod? You take a baseball bat and you hit somebody with it, what are you going to do to that person? You're going to break them, physically I'm talking about. They didn't have urgent care. They didn't go over there and say, okay, 911, what's your emergency? No, 
He's down over there with Dr. Luke, and they're trying to reset it on the side of the road. And you're boohooing over who's in office today. Priorities, folks. That's what we're getting at. You see, Paul comes along. Of the Jews, five times received I 40 stripes, save one. They never beat him 40 times. They always thought that last one would kill him. So they all, but how many times was he beaten? Five times. Now, five times 40 is what? 200, right? Last time I did math. That's 200, and 200 stripes he received. They weren't able to run down to Banner Healthcare and bandage him up. They're down over there putting the ointment that they have that Dr. Luke has in his bag to do. And you're worried about what the market's going to do. Now, legitimate worries, don't get me wrong. I'm not discounting that. I'm talking about priority, thinking what's important. Our pattern didn't say, well... It's all bad today, so let's just throw the covers over and not go anyway. No, what did he say? Let's go to work. Well, what's going to happen? To, what, you know, he didn't say that at all. By the way, if you look, are you still in, in 2 Corinthians 11? Look at verse 32. In Damascus, the governor under Artus, the king, kept the city of the of the uh, Damascus scenes with a garrison desiring to what? There's your politics for you. What was they doing? They're wanting to get him. You know what that means? That means he's on their radar. Do you know that today you're not on anybody's radar? Yeah, but you know that so-and-so over there, they mentioned me. You're on nobody's radar. He was. Now, he's there because of the Jews and the uprest and everything. And through a window and a basket was I let down by the wall and escaped his hands. And you read that and you say, wow. Here's our example. Here's our pattern. And he understood. He understood what was the priority. Come over to 1 Corinthians 15. We're going to leave the the board here a little bit. Look at 1 Corinthians 15. He understood the purpose of God. He understood the message, the doctrine. 1 Corinthians 15, verse number 10, Paul says, But by the grace of God I am what I am, and His grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. Can you say that? Think about you. Don't answer me. Think about you. Can you say that, hey, you know what? The grace bestowed upon me is not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I. Now watch the thinking. Did Paul go work? (laughs) Yeah. He's over there working with Aquila and Priscilla. He's doing this. He's laboring. You know, that thing. But he does it how? What's the motivation? But the grace of God which was with me. What's motivating Paul to do? The grace of God. What was motivating him before? Politics, finances, entertainment, things of the flesh. What's motivating him now? Things of the inner man. What's the move? What's the push? What's the movement? Come over with me to 1 Timothy chapter 6. What should our property properties? What should our priorities be? Philodia, yeah. By the way, on your way to First Timothy, stop in Philippians three. What should our priorities be? Well, how about to to grow in the grace and the love of God? Grow up in the doctrine, take the doctrine that we're learning about who we are in Christ those identification truths, and to come along and to put them into the details of our life and have that be what is what is looked at. How about us go be 2 Corinthians 5.20, the ambassadors for Christ? How about us go and do and have the doctrine come and be put, make all men see what is the fellowship of the gospel, of the mystery? 
How do I do that? Well, I'm going to do what? I'm going to provide for my family. I'm going to go get a job and take care of my responsibilities as a head of my household, as a, my family's. And I'm going to do that. Why? Because that's what the sound doctrine tells me to do. I'm going to have our family life and our home life represent and, and be where it needs to be as members of the church, the body of Christ, as who we are. I'm going to come over and I'm going to participate in the work of the ministry. And I'm going to help with what's going on at church. And I'm going to be actively involved in it. And I'll be honest with you, all of you are actively involved. You know why? Because you're here. See, sometimes we get this idea that, you know what, i got to be out passing tracks or doing this and, you know, talking Bible. And that's not the work of the ministry all the time. That is a big component. But you just simply living who you are in Christ is your work of ministry. When you come over and you look at your spouse and your family and your job and you look at it from the way the sound doctrine. Folks, why do you think we spent like 18, 19, 20 weeks looking at Ephesians 5 last year? Because that's you doing the work of the ministry. That's you being an ambassador. Philippians 3, verse 17. Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an ensample. Not example. By the way, example and ensample are two different words. You know how you know they're spelled different? That's the big way. But you look them up in the dictionary, and I know what the dictionary does. It begins to play little word games and get them close. But they're two different words. In sample. E-N. In. The sample. X ample. By the way, it's not X sample. It's X ample. That's the outside. What's going on on the inside? Why in the world would we mark Paul as a good pattern? Because he's such a great guy? Because he looks good? I mean, if you got beat up that much, you'd be marred too. You're physically repulsive. That's why they say his outward appearance is what? Weak. No. Why do we mark Paul? What's going on inside of him? The pattern of the whole. The portion of every. Here he is. And what does he say? He says, hey, look, man, you take in the word of God. You 2 Timothy 3, 16 it, and you have that reproof and correction, and you let the word work in your life, and you know what you begin to do? You begin to display the life of Christ, Christ in your life. And you begin to come over here, and you begin to do. And you know what you're doing? You're not doing anything you wouldn't normally do, but you're doing who you are in Christ. 1 Timothy 6. I always remind myself of this verse. Romans, uh, 1 Timothy 6, verse 17. Romans, uh, 1 Timothy 6, 17. Paul says, Charge them that are rich in the world, that they be not high-minded, nor trust in, in, in uncertain riches, but in the living God, who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. You know what Paul doesn't Paul doesn't say not to enjoy life. You notice that? He says, "Hey, you he's given us richly all things to what? To enjoy." So when you go enjoy life, I I was thinking about that. The Alabama game was on. I see pictures of everybody hiking the snow and out doing, and I'm like, they're out enjoying life. But when you go enjoy life, do it as who you are in Christ. Do it that way. You know, I, w I was sitting up at the light on Main Street, Apache Trail, and guys went, went by me on the motorcycle. And I'm like, oh, Harley dealer, here I come. You know, I passed it. but I was... And then I got to thinking, why do you, you know, then you see the dog hanging out the window and the wind's blowing. And I go, I know what he feels like. I like that. What's going on? And you get, I get drunk. But what, what is that? That's an enjoyment of life. 1 Corinthians 16. You see, folks, when something comes up in life, you got the Word of God right here to come along and do what? Here's how to handle it. So then I go over here and I put it on display. If I'm on a job, 
Here's how Christ would respond to that. Here's, if I'm mom at home, here's how Christ would respond. If you're, I mean, we just had great family times. Here's what family responds. Here's, and what happens is, is your priority begins, hey, here's what Christ, here's how Christ would think in this situation. And I got there because I adjusted my thinking. We're going to talk next week about how that works and how you adjust your thinking. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 13. This is a great verse. Uh, by the way, they're all great. Okay, Just some, you know how you fall in love with some? Watch ye, stand fast in the faith. Quit you, quit ye, quit you like men. Be strong. I always used to read that verse. Now, Paul's dealing with the Corinthians who are pretty weak. They're carnal. They're growing, though. He's been, he's been rebuking them, 16 chapters of hard rebuke. He's been on them. Then he gets to the end here. He talks about the guys, verse 15, being addicted to the, to the ministry of the saints. But before that, verse 13, well, watch ye. Hey, you need to pay attention to what your priorities are. What were they at Corinth? It wasn't doing the work of the ministry. It wasn't doing that. It was over here living for themselves, doing what they wanted to do. He Over there, he tells them, that guy that committed the sin, kick him out. And they're like, well, we'll be a little more gracious than our beloved brother Paul, and we'll keep him. Paul's like, I didn't tell you to keep him and let him stay. I told you to turn him over, get him out. Why? A little leaven. There's get him out. And they're, no, we're going to be more gracious than those guys down there. They're a little hot-headed. No. There's a reason. Get him out. So watch ye. Hey, you need to pay attention to what your priority is. Come over real quick to 1 Timothy 4. 1 Timothy 4. What should your priority be? Watch ye. 1 Timothy 4, verse 15 and 16. Meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them that thy profiting may appear to all. See that appear to all? That's going on. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. Timothy's down. Paul says you need to continue in what you learn, Timothy. You need to keep going. Come over to 2 Timothy chapter 2, chapter 3. 2 Timothy 3. You know what you need to be doing in, in 2022? You need to be, make sure your priorities are right. Watch it. Pay attention to it. 2 Timothy 3, verse 13. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. What's the condition of man? Where's it going? Are you going to stop it? No, you're not. Man's been on a sinful trek down to the puddle since Adam. But watch verse 14. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Boy, you better stay the case. Apostasy comes into every local church. It comes into every believer's life when they leave Paul first. And don't recognize the distinctive ministry given to Paul. And he's like, look, it's going to get bad out there, guys. And what you need to do is continue in where you learned. Go back to... 1 Corinthians 16. i got to get this verse in 13. Watch ye. Hey, you need to pay attention to your priorities. What should your priorities be? Hey, let's take heed to the doctrine. Let's get the doctrine in us. But Rick, I don't know it. That's okay. We're studying it. We're learning it. We're growing in it. Then he says, stand fast in the faith. Stand fast in the faith. Galatians 5 verse 1, stand fast therefore in the liberty. Wherewith Christ has what? Made us free. Set us free. Stand fast in the liberty of God's grace. Don't you, you can't stand anywhere else. Stand there. By the way, stand fast. Girded down. Hunkered down. Strapped down. Then he says, Quit ye like men. That word quit, it means to perform something to the end so that nothing remains. We think about quit as in, is he done yet? Will he finally quit and stop? 
quit ye, quit you like men. Perform all the way to the end so that there's nothing that remains. You know the old sayings, you know, you, you can think of them. Paul says, no quit, man. Quit you like men, men, mature. You're going to take the reproof. You take the correction for what it's for, what the design is, and you apply it to the details of your life. 1 Corinthians 13, Paul says, When I became a man, I put away childish things. It's time to put away childish things. I'll be honest with you. I just, my own personal opinion, the politics of the day is a childish thing. Paul tells us not to entangle. A good soldier doesn't entangle himself in the affairs of this world. You get sucked up into that, the COVID business, any of it, and you know what you're not thinking about? Who you are in Christ. You're worried about something else. Now, I know you got to do to survive and live. I'm not saying don't. I'm just saying don't get overtaken by it. Don't let it consume you. Because you know what a man does? A mature, men, mature. It says, you know what? We're going to put away the childish things. We're about this. This is what we're about. Then he says, be strong. (laughs) Be strong. Take the doctrine and allow it to work in your life. In all the details. No matter what you go do. Okay? I watch the football game. I'm sitting there. I'm enjoying the football game. You do what you do. You enjoy that. That's great. But don't let it do what? Begin to control. When you come along and you read a verse like verse 13, now you know why verse 15 he says they've addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. Why? Because what's on their mind? Think about Paul. What was his priority? Before Christ, just living life like everybody else, climbing the ladders. But once Christ got a hold of him, yes, he's the apostle. But he said, I learned. I was there. I was instructed. I grew. So can you. The priorities that you and I have as we go into 2022 is such that we need to maybe adjust them. Maybe not. You do that. I I do that for me. But as we go into the new year now, we do it with our eyes wide open. Folks, COVID's here. It ain't going anywhere. Might as well deal with it. It just is. Now, you can boo-hoo it and wish it not, but it is. You can protest, do whatever you want, but it's here. Well, then you're just giving in. You're one of the sheep. No, I'm a realist. It is here. The politics will never get better. It'll only get what? Worse and worse. It can run your life, both scenarios. That's the big topic, big talk today. I saw a thing on Facebook where they took the word Delta and Omicron, rearranged the letters into media control. I'm like, well, that was pretty smart. True or not, it doesn't matter. What's true? Who you are in Christ. What's going to matter? Who you are in Christ. If you were to die today and you go to heaven's glory, what went with you? who you are in Christ. Let's be about building that guy up, strengthening him. And then your priorities will become completely different. Okay? What did our pattern do? Did Paul claim, did he appeal to Caesar? Sure he did. Was he aware of what his rights were? Sure he did. But they didn't control him. You follow that? All right, now that's my COVID speech for the year. Okay? I promise. But you have to understand... What, what is our priority? We need to set that, okay? No matter where you're at in life, the Word of God directly impacts you, and you need to let it happen that way. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the morning. Lord, we thank you for your Word. We thank you for the Apostle Paul. We thank you for his pattern. We thank you for everything that we have in your Son. And Lord, I just pray as we begin the new year and as we begin... This year we do so with an understanding of where our priorities are and our need to adjust them to match your priorities and what you're doing. 
And when we do that, Lord, we know that we're, we're, we're walking worthy of you because we're doing what you would have us do as your ambassadors. In your name we pray. Amen. All right.